Well, thank you so much. So that, do you guys know where, yeah, you know where that is. There's yeah. parking usually back there. You have my cell phone number, but yes. I will plan on seeing you, yeah. you know, around 11, 11, 15 or yeah. something. Okay. Yeah. okay. So thank much. you so much. Yes, you too. Do you guys need like a, do you want to keep this in I case you want to do yes. like a mm -hmm. photo yes. shot yes. of that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Jessica Early, thanks so much for for it being interviewed by us. Thank you, 17. thank you for having me here. So, and and who is who else is here with us uh, uh, remotely? So we have Mary Garish, who is one of our Rights and Democracy board members, and she has been an advocate for a healthcare system um, that serves us all and healthcare as a human right for many years in this state. She is down in Bennington, Vermont, and she is a veteran, actually, of. Mary, is it two or three, at least two um, delegations of RAD Rights and Democracy members that we sent down to Washington, D.C. to stage direct actions against the various uh, Republican yeah, it bills? Yeah. It's three. Three times yeah. Mary has gone down to D.C. Uh, to fight for health care as a human right um, and health care for all. So, Mary, welcome. Do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Mary Garish. Uh, and I'm here in Bennington, and I'm very proud to be a board member of Rights and Democracy. And I'm also very excited that Rights and Democracy is continuing the work on Act 48, um, with which I've been involved for many years, uh, first through the Healthcare as a Human Rights Campaign at the Vermont Workers' Center, and now, of course, through RAS. Well, Jessica, you're a working nurse and, and nurse practitioner, and you're also the healthcare uh, activist and advocate for for rights and democracy. So specifically, what are, what are you doing? What is the drive right now? So um, I am. I am a, a working nurse and nurse practitioner. I um, am rights and democracy's healthcare justice organizer. And for the past several months, um, we've been really organizing around um, the principle, the founding, prin the foundational principle. I think that we're all driving for is to win here in Vermont and eventually across the country um, health care as a human right and public good delivered to every person, every human being, regardless of ability of, to pay, via pu a publicly and equitably financed system. And um, health care being a fundamental right is a principle uh, most other countries, whether industrialized or, or not, um, actually enshrine and uphold and accept. Uh, and the U.S. is very, very um, behind on that front. I think Mary would probably agree. She's a, a human rights lawyer and has done a lot of work in that arena. Um, and so here in Vermont, we believe that we have a law in the books that enshrines that principle. And it's the only way, achieving that um, is really the only way that we're going to ensure that the patients I see every week, mostly patients who are um, uh, dependent on Medicaid and Medicare, mostly older folks, um, get the high quality health care that they need. Um, because I encounter a lot of people in my work and in my conversations as an organizer with Rights and Democracy who have to make choices every day between things like medication and groceries, going to the doctor, and you know having a ride or transportation to work and these are choices that in a uh, healthy thriving egalitarian society no one should have to make um, and so we at rights and democracy are sort of fighting on two levels we're resisting very very vigorously the national Republican agenda to dismantle health care, to fundamentally restructure Medicaid as we know it, to the great detriment of poor and working people in this country. And also, let's remember that Medicaid is not just a program for the poor, it's a program for all of us. It's the biggest payer of long-term care, which most of us, either ourselves or one of our loved ones, will eventually need. Uh, long-term care or nursing home care for um, older folks that need a higher level of care and can't be taken care of in their home in their older age. 
Um, Medicaid pays for that. Medicaid pays for almost half of all births in this country. Um, it pays for a tremendous amount of women's health. So these are fundamentally um, crucial programs for huge swaths of the population, and uh, they're under attack by the Republican administration, which also wants to roll back um, many of the gains made under the Affordable Care Act, which we all know wasn't perfect, but also at the same time made many improvements to a sort of cowboy capitalist healthcare system in which pre-existing conditions barred people from getting the care they need prior to the protections enshrined in the ACA. So at the national level, with an eye, eye toward what has been happening um, coming out of Congress, we at Rights and Democracy are organizing people to resist cuts to Medicaid, any attempts to voucherize Medicare, and roll back and or repeal of or destabilization of the ACA, because that would have tremendous fallout for Vermonters and millions of people across this country. Um, and at the same time, because of the very cuts that are being proposed nationally, we feel that here in Vermont, to protect Vermonters from these grave threats, we really need to move ahead with universally universal health care that is equitably and publicly financed as um, laid out in Act 48. And we have or, uh, members organizing across the state to get there. There are different paths. There's something called universal primary care um, that would provide primary care, mental health, and addiction treatment services free of charge to all Vermonters. That's a bill in the state house that may be one step in, in the right direction to get us to Act 48. Um, but regardless of what legislative path we ultimately take, we know that at the end of the day, Vermonters have a big appetite and are ready for a healthcare system that serves us all. Um, and I think Mary can speak more specifically to Act 48 if you have further questions. Yes, we, we definitely do. And what exactly is the is the Act, well, what are the main things in Act 48, Mary, that would, would yep. bring you, this direct, direct universal health care to Vermonters? Act 48, which is currently the law, that everyone who lives in the state of Vermont, whether they're a citizen or not, um, has to be able to re exercise their right to health care. And that act specifically proclaims that health care is a human right in the state of Vermont. And that's a really important thing. The other thing that that act does is it says that we will have a single system of payment for all of our health care that will be administered by a, an agency set up by the state, and presumably they will hire people who are experts in this sort of thing. So it's really a single-payer system. It specifically says in the Act that we will have a single payment source for all medical bills. And basically what Act 48 does is it says that we will join the rest of the industrialized world. Um, when we say universal health care, sometimes people aren't clear on what that means, even though in other countries they are in this country. And it's essentially the same thing as a health care for all, Medicare for all, and, it, and it's based on health care, not health insurance. Because in our country, um, and this is one of the reasons why they didn't think Act 48 was passed. In our country, people equate health insurance with health care, and it is not the same thing as we know. So Act 48 actually provides health care, not health insurance, to everyone, um, paid for by the state, such that we would have the same system as other countries, where every person that lives in Vermont would get a card, and when I had to go to the doctor, the doctor would swipe the card, and they're going to be paid. I wouldn't have to pay to see the doctor uh, cash out of my pocket. I wouldn't have to pay deductibles. I wouldn't have to pay premiums. And all of this would be financed equitably and progressively. One of the things people get scared about with Act 48 is that it's paid for by public taxes and everybody says, oh my gosh, 
I can't, no, no, not a tax increase. What we have to educate people about is that the progressive taxation, which will be based on your income, is still, every time, going to be much, much less than what you are currently paying for an insurance premium, and you won't have to pay the insurance premium. Therefore, even though it's an additional tax, it means more money in your pocket for anyone who is paying. That, that sounds great, Mary, but how, how, how does that work? Is it because all of us will be then paying into it? Is that why? That, that, That's correct. Yeah. It will be that all of us are paying into it, and businesses similarly, based at least upon the financing plan that, that we proposed for Act 48, businesses will pay an income tax also. And that would also be a progressive income tax. So that um, it would, obviously the larger companies would pay a lot more. And the, and, and the thing is that we're cutting out so much expense by cutting out the insurance company. The, the amount of overhead each individual doctor's office needs just to deal with insurance companies is amazing. And there, that would be totally cut out. Like, if you go to the hospital in France and say, okay, I'm checking out, where's the billing department? And they go, we don't have a billing department. Tons of people are necessary to process insurance claims and codes, and each company has a different code. All of those folks in Act 48, it says, would be retrained because their, net, their services aren't needed anymore to process insurance claims, all of those folks would be retrained for jobs in the actual healthcare industry because we would obviously need more people in the healthcare industry. So our, the expenses go down incredibly when you don't have all that overhead, not only in doctor's offices, but hospitals and everywhere else. The other thing Act 48 would allow us to do is to engage in global purchasing, which is really interesting because one of the reasons, for example, that an MRI here in this country costs thousands and thousands of dollars, I mean, anywhere between two and five, depending on what you get done, and it costs less than a thousand over in other countries, is because of mass purchasing. It's like going to a Sam's Club for your medical equipment or a wholesale, you know, BJ's, something like that. And the same thing happens with medication. So the cost is automatically cut down when we have more purchasing power. And this is what Canada found. And in Canada, as you probably know, Saskatchewan was the first province to do this. And the rest of the country said, nah, not going to work. We can't afford it. It turned out that they had better health outcomes and lower health costs per person. And so Canada said, oh, wait a minute. So the whole country did it. That's what we can do here in Vermont if we have the people power to actually get this law that's on the books implemented. And, yes. And, and Mary, thank you so much for that. And I would also just add that I think it's, you know, Mary makes a good point that people get really scared and nervous for understandable reasons when we talk about progressive taxation or any kind of taxes, right? It's such a taboo word, the idea that we would pay higher taxes for anything. But I think we also have to remember that, um, you know, I think why we're so fearful of taxation in this country is because unfortunately, our government at the state and federal level has been so leached and sapped and, and drained of resources over many de decades under a very, um, you know, a, 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 a very planned out agenda of the conservative and, and, and right wing in this country to, um, you know, sort of undermine the role of government. Um, Americans aren't used to getting much from their taxes, right? Because it's sort of like this vicious cycle where we don't fund and provide enough revenue to our government agencies, and then as a result, they aren't able to provide as much as they otherwise would be able to if they were adequately, adequately funded. And the net result is people feel like the government doesn't do anything for them. So it's completely understandable that a lot of folks 
don't feel like they are they just see money going out of their paycheck every week and not getting anything in return and i think we at rights and democracy believe that we we really have to start reframing things around what are our priorities as communities and what does it mean to invest? Because in other countries that have national health care systems, they generally have much higher tax rates, but they get so much in return, as Mary mentioned, right? They don't have to worry about paying astronomical premiums and, and having huge deductibles that make it virtually impossible to go to the doctors, basically. Um, but, you know, and, and, and they have... Um, better infrastructure. They have free, um, virtually free relative to us, higher education. They get all these things for what is taken out from their taxes. And so I think we need to remember that um, seeing our taxes go up, it, it's not like that money's going out into the ether. If we had Act 48, it would be an investment in all of our collective health and well-being. And we'd see something tremendous in return and we'd be able to mo much more robustly tackle things like the opiate epidemic and the, the crisis of substance abuse in this state which is ravaging many communities. We'd be able to um, you know, invest in mental health which is woefully overstretched and inadequate currently in Vermont. Um, and so I think we need to fundamentally sort of change and shift how we think about taxation and recognize that that's actually how we invest in our communities and improve the quality of life, uh, improve people's quality of life, especially the quality of life of, of poor and working and middle class families in this state. Um, and so I don't know about you, but I, in my conversations with many of my patients, with people throughout the state, people are ready to chip in a little bit more if it means that they um, you know, are able to access going to the doctor if it means that, you know, their neighbor who is a diabetic is actually able to pay for their insulin and doesn't have to wait until, you know, they're in the emergency room having their, because they're, they have a massive diabetic foot infection and now we need astronomically expensive hospital level care to get their toes amputated. That, to me, is not the types of communities we want to live in. We want to live in communities that invest in keeping us healthy and keeping us out of the hospital and keeping us, um, you know, uh, uh, working and well and thriving. Um, and so I think Mary would agree that, that um, we're all willing to pay a little bit more to create the type of robust government services that, that um, you know, build strong, vibrant, healthy communities for us now and in the future. And I think that applies to the range of issues that rights and democracy is fighting for, whether it be health care or things that we need to address, you know, just as imminently like the climate, climate crisis. So, Mary, anything to add to that? No, that was, that was great. I agree with everything you said. And I just want to emphasize that the point that you made because and, and for me of course health care isn't all about cost it's about outcomes and about human dignity and human suffering however I do know that everyone that is opposed to universal care talks about cost and you made a very key point Jessica because the reason our costs are so high is because people can't get the medical care they need until they wind up having to be admitted to intensive care, let's say, and then the costs are skyrocketing. If that diabetic had gotten the treatment they needed to begin with, and they don't need now to be in the ICU, they don't need the amputation, the costs go down dramatically. And this is what other countries, have. and even in terms of, as you said, the tax uh, and benefit analysis, is really important. I, I just want a, a, a very short story. When I was in Geneva advocating at the UN um, for the United States requiring universal health care, I noticed that our hotel, as most of the hotels there, are half hotel and half what they call pensionnaires, which are housing for people who are older and don't have housing and need medical care, they have, for example, a medical practitioner on each floor, 
a doctor that will come in and see them. And it's all already paid for by taxes so that they have the care they need. They have the long-term care. They have the independence, but they still have somewhere to live. So this impacts housing, education, all the things that Jessica mentioned. And those are all tied in with our health care because it's not it's all like a wheel and spoke thing. And our, our health care is one aspect of our human rights and our human dignity that is impacted and interrelated to all of our other human rights. And that's what RAD is fighting for. Yeah. And it's the sooner that we get on board with people realizing how important it is to care for each other through a single, universal, healthcare for all system, the sooner people are going to realize the other advantages of that sort of taxation. And um, and to get us there, because I, I always, I'm an organizer, and so I want to talk about a little bit how we can get there. How can we get full implementation of Act 48? Rights and Democracy um, feels that it's really important, you know, we're called rights and democracy. We believe in winning uh, the recognition and the full, um, you know, vigorous implementation of all our rights, our rights to health care, our rights to clean water, clean environment, an equitable economy that works for us all. We want to win those rights and see every person in Vermont, um, you know, having them in a very full way. And the way we get there is by bringing people, everyday Vermonters, back into our democracy, which we know at the national level and even here in Vermont to some extent has been hijacked by corporate, well-moneyed, private interests that um, through, you know, no, essentially no campaign finance laws that are really strong in this country have allowed, have been, uh, have sort of taken over our political system and have undue influence. And so we want to return democracy into the hands of, of Vermonters, of people. And so we believe that to win any of these fights for Act 48, for universal primary care, for, for a health care system that works for us all, we need people in the state house to be standing with us. And the only way we can do that is mobilize thousands of Vermonters to stand up and say to their elected leaders, hey, these are our priorities, these are our concerns, these are what this is what we're seeing in our communities, and you know, you represent us and you need to fight for us. And so um, we have this wonderful I am a healthcare justice voter sign on card, which people are basically signing up saying that they believe that healthcare is a human right. They believe in the full implement that Act 48, which is current law, should be fully implemented and things like universal primary care should be passed. They believe that our governor and other elected officials should stand up, which which Governor Stott, to his credit, has recently done but needs to continue to do and needs to work with us. To, he's, he stood up against um, the Trump and GOP in Congress uh, congressional GOP's health care bills. Uh, to his credit, Scott has done that, and we need him to continue to stand with us as we move ahead towards things like Act 48. Um, and the way we show our elected officials, because the one thing we know politicians respond to is votes. And uh, at Rights and Democracy, we are going to only support candidates that are standing up very strongly for health care that is publicly and equitably financed and serves us all. Um, and if they're not going to stand up for that, then we are going to train candidates and run candidates who will. Um, and so if you're interested in this work, please go to Rights and Democracy, um, radvt.org. Sign up to be a healthcare justice a voter. Um, you can share your story with us. If you have a healthcare story, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to talk to you. But, um, you know, especially with the new legislative session starting with the elections in 2018, um, you know, if Vermonters really want to see things change, they need to get involved. They need to, you know, claim their seat as, as voters, as, as um, people that have a voice in the democratic process, and we want to help them do so. 
um, and and really take back the state house, which is our house and which should be a place where we're moving forward with legislation that really helps us all um, win things like universal health care, win things like um, more equitable economy through things like raising the minimum wage um, and you know other really important initiatives to working and middle class families in this state. And we know we can do this. We because do. Because the way that we got Act 48 passed was by mobilizing thousands of people in Vermont who said, wait a minute, that's my legislator. They work for me. I don't work for them. And if they're not going to work for me, I'll make sure that I elect somebody who does. And even though everybody was told from the beginning that it wasn't politically possible to pass Act 48, this is what a lot of representatives said, by the time that thousands of people got through making their voices heard to those legislators, they voted it in. And it was a complete shock to most people because they didn't realize the power that the people really have. And if we retake our democracy in this state, um, anything is politically possible. I don't think rights and democracy right. believes that there are things that are quote unquote politically impossible. That's a vicious cycle. You know, you always hear, um, oh, we can't do that. We can't, we can't move that far. We can't be that bold. Um, Vermonters across the board who we've talked to are ready for bold action. And to be honest, a lot of my patients for whom health care is a life and death issue can't really afford for us to go with half measures or, you know, wait and feel out what's going to happen from the federal level. It is time for our legislators, it's time for our governor to take bold action um, to build, again, safe, equitable, healthy, thriving communities here in the state. Obviously, we're talking about um, having our government be accountable to our interests. And um, when we were reading through Act 48, preparing for this interview, uh, accountable was a word that stood out to us. Uh, it's used repeatedly, accountable health care. And we wanted to ask right. you what isn't accountable about our health care currently and um, what changes we would like to see. I, I would love to answer that question because when Act 48 was being written, we spent a lot of time talking about how do we make the system accountable to each one of us. And what we came up with is a section of Vermont's Act 48 that says that health care has to be equitably administered as well as financed. And what that means, because it's a term that most of us aren't familiar with, it doesn't mean that we all get the same thing. And it means that we each get what each of us needs. And that's why in Act 48, each person gets the medically necessary care that that person needs. I don't, I have MS. I don't need somebody else's medication. I need my medication. They don't need my medication. So therefore, coming up with a list of what's covered, quote, and not covered, quote, is a kind of ridiculous process, and it means that our health system isn't accountable to each of our needs. So there's a definition of medical necessity in Act 48 that basically says what you need as a medical necessity will be paid for by this health care system, and that if you have a problem with it, you can go to an independent board, and in our case, that's we created the Green Mountain Care Board, and say, what's going on here? Why can't I get the care that I need? So that the health system responds to us, not we respond to them by not getting treatment or delaying treatment, or getting treat we can get treatment somebody else needs, but not treatment that we need. So when we say it's accountable to us, it means we get to hold it accountable. We have a mechanism for holding it accountable that's an independent advisory board. And we also get to hold our legislators accountable for making sure that our health care system serves our 
needs and is equitably financed. So when we talk about it being accountable to us, we're really talking about two things. We're talking about it being able to serve each individual's needs, and we're also talking about it being responsive to individuals who don't feel their needs are being served. I don't know if that clarifies any. I think it does. Yeah, that does help. So, Jessica, um, what what can you talk to us person to person and tell us what we can do now in this time frame? Yes. Yeah. So that is the most important question. And again, um, I would say a first step is to check out Rights and Democracy and our work and sign up to be a healthcare justice voter um, because it's really important that we get tremendous uh, numbers of people sort of standing up and demonstrating that they believe in healthcare as a human right. They believe Vermont should move ahead with building a, a healthcare system that delivers healthcare as a right and as a public good um, equitably to us all. Um, and so at radvt.org, you can sign up to be a healthcare justice voter. We also need people to share their stories. We're finding that the most moving and compelling thing by far, I could rattle off a lot of statistics about the costs of our current broken healthcare system and um, you know negative health outcomes and uh, ways other countries in Europe and in Can and, and also Canada and um, even even some you know developing nations that have universal health care are, are seeing better health outcomes and cost controls that can be a little abstract to people for understandable reasons what not what is not abstract and what feels very real to people is you know, their personal experiences with our healthcare system, not being able to get the care they need, having loved ones that, you know, have forgone needed medical care because they couldn't afford it, or they were scared that, um, you know, they were gonna get hit by bills, or they hadn't reached their deductible yet, so they didn't wanna go to the primary care doctor to get something checked out, and then it turned into a much more serious illness that landed them in the hospital. Um, and, and, you know, those kind of stories really resonate with people. It's the stories I encounter on a weekly basis as a nurse, and it's the stories I encounter as I, you know, do organizing work, just talking to folks in Burlington and throughout the state. Um, and, and we really need to hear those stories. Our elected officials need to hear those stories because we need to really make people aware and educate folks um, that, you know, the way things are currently is is no longer acceptable. It hasn't been acceptable for many years, um, and it's finally time for us to move on and create something better and um, ensure that you know our healthcare system is uh, driven by the needs and the 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 uh, goal of of achieving the best quality of life for people versus um, you know the bottom line of for profit pharmaceutical industry, the, the for-profit pharmaceutical industry, private insurance, med medical device manufacturers, you know, that's not, as a nurse, that is not what health is about. Health is about giving people the medical care they need when, how, and where they need it, and not worrying about whether, you know, an insurance company is going to see their profit margins rise. Um, and so, you know, sign up to be a healthcare justice voter, share your story. You can also do that at Rights and Democracy. Talk to your neighbors, talk to your elected officials. If you have a healthcare story, call up your state senator, call up your, your house rep, share these stories with them. Um, and, you know, that's what we need en masse, collectively, starting to talk about uh, publicly. Write a letter to the editor, you know. Um, in your in your local paper, in in, in uh, on a blog, whatever it need, whatever you can do, to start, um, you know, raising awareness, uh, getting active, connecting in your community around the issues that you care about, and I would encourage you to do that. Whether it's healthcare, whether it's environmental justice, racial, gender whatever justice causes that you feel strongly about um, you know things only change to the extent that we stand up shout loudly and change them ourselves i i just want to um emphasize about the stories jessica is so right i know when we were first trying to get at 48 passed 
those were the crucial thing because that's just the consent. Facts and figures, people can argue all day long. You know, everybody's got a different take on them. We're human beings. And whether we want to admit it or not, suffering by a fellow human being is something that we can't ignore. When you look in someone's eyes and see that they, how much they've suffered by this healthcare story that they're telling about themselves or a family member who has died, you cannot ignore that. You can't combat it with another set of figures because it is true human suffering and all of us as human beings want to try and eliminate human suffering as much as possible. Thank you, Mary. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you for taking the time for us to share this um, this important message with you. Of course. Thanks so much. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Thank okay. you, Jessica, for coming Thank back. you, Mary. And thank you, Mank, for <laughs> Thank you, Jessica. Thanks, everybody.